Adolf Hitler experienced the loss of his close family members and suffered painful setbacks in the course of his life that gave rise to a disturbing hatred for Israel that pushed him to lay waste to six million Jews. Such is the tale of Adolf Hitler's genocide plan on the Jews living in Germany at the time. His deep hatred made him criticize, isolate, and stir others to do the same. What did they do? What causes this hatred? Join us as we unveil the real reason Hitler hated the Jews that shocks the world. Today, the Holocaust was one of the most horrific events in modern history. Ob du glaubst, dass ich gewesen bin, dass ich The real reason Hitler hated the Jews. The journey into why Adolf Hitler hates Jews did. It begins in the political arena of 20th century Germany, but rather in the seemingly mindset events of his early life. He was born in 1889 in Brauno, Austria, and his childhood was marked by the common struggle of the time, personal tragedy, and a troubled family life that would cast long shadows over his future. His father, Alois Hitler was a tough and authoritative man, and his relationship with his son, Joseph, was difficult and filled with tension. With the death of his younger brother Edmund in 1900, Adolf was badly affected. It pushed him into a period of intense depression and separation during his growing years. This initial brush with death and loss may have begun to shape Hitler's emotional development. Hitler was a normal student, and his academic performance was inconsistent at best. He nurtured a passion for art and dreamed of becoming a painter. This passion drove him to Vienna, where his applications to the Academy of Fine Arts were twice rejected. These rejections were not only academic setbacks, but also personal humiliations for Hitler, which contributed to his growing feelings of bitterness and resentment. At the turn of the 20th century, Vienna was a melting pot of nations and ethnicities, including a large Jewish community. It was here that Hitler first encountered widespread prejudice sentiments, which were common in certain aspects of Viennese society. He also came in contact with the works of anti-Semitic thinkers and politicians, such as Karl Luger, the mayor of Vienna, whose rhetoric and policies against Jews left a lasting impression on Hitler. In addition, Hitler's years in the city of Vienna were laced with significant hardship. He lived an unconventional life, moving from hostel to hostel and, at times, living on the streets. His failure to gain admission into the art academy, coupled with a lack of steady employment, adds to a period of personal crisis for him. It was during this year's struggle that Hitler's ideologies began to take a more logical shape as he sought explanations and reasons for his failures. The racism literature that Hitler found during his Vienna years played a critical role in shaping his views on Jews, pamphlets, and newspapers. Blaming Jews for societal and economic ills reinforced existing prejudices in the society and ordered him a convenient scapegoat for the frustrations and disappointment of his own life. The outbreak of World War I was a turning point for Hitler. He volunteered for the German army and the experience of serving in the war left a huge impact. Hitler found purpose in the camaraderie and nationalistic fervor of the military. The end of the war and Germany's defeat left him deeply disillusioned with the Weimar Republic. The Treaty of Versailles, which he, along with many Germans, viewed as a betrayal, further fueled his desire for a renewed, powerful Germany. By the time the war ended, Hitler had developed a worldview that was intensely nationalistic, anti-Marxist, and fundamentally anti-Semitic. He believed that the Jews were not only responsible for Germany's defeat in war, but also for the broader ills of society, including the spread of communism and the perceived moral decay of the nation. This belief system provided a foundation for Hitler's future actions and the horrific policies he would implement as leader of the Nazi party. Myths and Misconceptions When delving into the dark heart of history's most infamous dictator, Adolf Hitler, and his deep hatred for Jews, it's easy to stumble upon a maze of myths and misconceptions. These simplistic explanations often distort the complex reality, offering a skewed understanding of one of the 20th century's most catastrophic events. There is a conviction behind every action, so also there are beliefs behind the prejudice of Hitler on Jews. What are these myths? Disturbing myths behind Adolf's hatred. A widely circulated myth suggests Hitler's hatred was purely personal, rooted in individual experiences with Jews, such as being rejected by the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, which some falsely claim was decided either by Jewish professors or through contracting syphilis from a Jewish prostitute. However, these theories lack substantial evidence and fail to explain the scale and intensity of his anti-Semitic policies. While personal experience might have played a role, they were not the sole or even primary drivers of his hatred. 
Another common belief is that Hitler envied the economic success of many Jewish families, which spurred his animosity. While it's true that racism rhetoric often focuses on the perceived economic control by Jews, this explanation oversimplifies the broader ideological and cultural factors at play. Hitler's views were shaped by a toxic blend of nationalist, racial, and social Darwinian theories prevalent in his time, which attributed far more than economic factors to the Jewish people. Many argue that Hitler merely used Jews as scapegoats for Germany's problems, including its defeat in World War I and economic hardships. While there is truth to the idea that Jews were victims to unite Germans under a common enemy, this theory underestimates the depth of Hitler's ideological commitment to racism. His public and private utterances reflect a genuine, deeply held belief in the danger and malignancy of Jews, not just a cynical use of them as political tools. It's often mistakenly thought that Hitler's racial prejudice emerged suddenly and fully formed. In reality, his hatred evolved, influenced by the anti-Semitic culture of early 20th century Europe. His personal experience in Vienna and during World War I and the impact of various anti-Semitic publications he consumed. This gradual radicalization is crucial to understanding the development of his ideology. While Hitler's anti-Semitism was extreme, it was not unique. In the context of early 20th century Europe, racism was widespread, with many sharing similar beliefs without necessarily endorsing genocide. What set Hitler apart was not his hatred in itself, but the extent to which he was able to institutionalize his hatred and mobilize an entire nation towards the genocide of Jews. Understanding Hitler's anti-Semitism requires acknowledging the complex interplay of personal experiences, cultural influences, and ideological convictions. Hitler was a product of his time, deeply influenced by the prevailing anti-Semitism sentiments and social Darwinism ideas. His worldview was shaped by a perverse interpretation of history, biology, and culture, which painted the Jews as the eternal enemies of the German people and the Aryan race. This perspective helps to see that Hitler's hatred was not an aberration, but the conclusion of centuries of race discrimination, intensified by the particular social, economic, and political condition of the post or World War I. It was this toxic mix that made his extreme views resonate with a significant portion of the German population, providing a fertile ground for the Holocaust. However, Adolf's view on racism has multiple effects both on his actions towards Jews and also in influencing the Nazis' government to be hostile and act superior. What were his ideas? What effects does he have on the Nazis? The birth of a terrifying ideology, Nazi convictions and concepts on race shaped all viewpoints of daily life and legislative issues in Nazi Germany. The Nazis grasped the wrong thought that Jews were a partitioned and second-rate race. The combined set of Nazi convictions and concepts about race is now and then named Nazi racism or Nazi racial ideology. Like other shapes of myths, Nazi prejudice was based on preferences and generalizations. They drew up their thoughts about race from beliefs that were widespread in Europe and North America. The myths of Nazi prejudice were extraordinary. They were based on Adolf Hitler's illustration of race. In his book, Mein Kampf, written in 1925, Hitler explained his superior worldview and elevated racial virtue and racial battle. After the Nazis came to control Germany, these thoughts drove the government's approach. Hitler's ideas about race have been broadly discredited as incorrect and corrupt. Nazi racism brought about the mistreatment and mass murder of six million Jews and millions of other individuals. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis believed that the world was divided into different races. According to the Nazis, each race had distinct characteristics. The Nazis believed that these qualities were passed down from generation to generation. Supposedly, all members of a race inherited the same qualities. These attributes were then said to determine the race's look, intelligence, inventiveness, and strength. The Nazis believed that some races possessed superior characteristics than others. According to Nazi ideology, the races with the best characteristics controlled the other races. Agreeing with Nazi ideas of race, Germans and other Northern Europeans named themselves Aryans, a prevalent race. Amid World War II, Nazi doctors conducted fake therapeutic tests looking to recognize physical proof of Aryan prevalence and non-Aryan mediocrity. Despite endless extermination of non-Aryan detainees within the course of these tests, 
The Nazis seem not to discover any proof for their speculations of organic racial contrasts among human creatures. Once in control, the Nazis executed racial laws and approaches that denied Jews, dark individuals, and Roma rovers of their rights. Amid World War II, the Nazi authorities said approximately what they alluded to as an ethnic house cleaning within the possessed eastern regions of Poland and the Soviet Union. This arrangement included the murder and demolition of so-called faux races, including the genocide of European Jews and the annihilation of the administration of the Slavic people groups. Nazi prejudice created murder on an exceptional scale. Literature can give extensive and deep knowledge on various subjects. And this is what shapes Adolf's mind about racism. What books did he read? How did it affect him? The prejudice literature influences on Hitler ideology. Adolf Hitler's journey into the depth of hatred to racism fervor was not a separate marvel. Or maybe it was altogether fed by the hatred of racism that he learned amid the development of a long time in Vienna and afterward. This chapter of his life shows how beyond any doubt, writing served to ignite the fire of Hitler's contempt towards Jews, forming his philosophy and activities for a long time to come. Vienna, at the turn of the 20th century, was overflowing with racialism activities. It was here, in the midst of the city's social and mental circles, that Hitler began to experience that hostility to Semitic writing that would significantly impact his worldview. Books, handouts, daily papers, and addresses painted Jews as the root of societal ills, using illusion, racial ideas, and writings modified to legitimize preference and separation. Among the works that had an impressive effect on Hitler was the foundation of the 19th century by Houston Stuart Chamberlain, a British-born Germanophile who embraced Ariad's matchless quality and Jewish mediocrity. Chamberlain's depiction of history as a racial battle with Jews showed an adulterating drive against the Aryan race, resounding profoundly with Hitler, giving an unscientific premise for his beginning against racism convictions. Another noteworthy impact was the composition of Karl Lueger, the chairman of Vienna, whose political victory was built on a stage of populism against Semitism. Luger's capacity to use race discrimination as a political tool shows Hitler the control of racial contempt as it implies arousing open back and accomplishing political goals. Maybe no other piece of writing did more to fuel Hitler's racialism scheme ideas than the Convention of Leaders of Zion. The created record, implying a diagram of Jewish arranged worldwide mastery, played specifically into Hitler's obsessive fears of a Jewish scheme against the German individuals. Despite being debunked as a scam, the conventions were broadly circulated and accepted into Semitic circles, which affected Hitler's conviction within the existing danger posed by the Jews. However, he was a customary scholar of different contrary writings to Semitic periodicals, such as Ostera, distributed by Lanz von Liebenfels, and Der Stormer, altered by Julius Streicher. These distributions, filled with offensive stories of Jewish tricks and ethical corruption, served to fortify Hitler's preferences and gave a steady stream of purposeful publicity that dehumanized Jews and portrayed them as foes of the German individuals. Hitler's expenditure did more than fairly fortify existing biases. It created a system for his broader ideological objectives by removing Jews as the source of all societal disasters. These works made a difference in Hitler's expression of a coherent worldview in which the elimination of Jews from German society was not alluring, but on an ethical basis. These writings played a significant part in shaping the Nazi party's arrangements and purposeful publicity. The subjects and accounts found in racism tracts were used in Nazi purposeful publicity, which uses similar strife to formulate the isolation, abuse, and possible genocide of Jews. Hitler's ability for speech and influence, combined with the ideological establishment from his research, led to a huge success in spreading anti-Semitic ideas among the German population. Political misuse of bias hostile toitism was not just an individual fixation for Adolf Hitler. It was a calculated political methodology carefully used to pick up and solidify control in a riotous post-World War I Germany. This chapter of his life dives into how his misused existing bias changed profound race discrimination into an impressive device that moved the Nazi party to prominence and empowered its hold on German society. The consequence of World War I cleared Germany in a state of significant emergency damage by financial turmoil and societal unrest, race discrimination, and long display in European society, which found rich ground in this post-war environment. 
Hitler, with a sharp sense of the winning societal disposition, recognized the potential of racism as a binding together drive that seemed to arouse the frustrated masses beneath the standard of the Nazi party. Central to Hitler's political methods was the development of the Jews as the model enemy of the German individuals. Through talks, purposeful publicity, and the Nazi party's writing, Jews were faulted for Germany's defeat within the watchful logical arrangement of Versailles and the financial hardships that followed. The Nazi publicity machine, initiated by figures Luke Joseph Goebbels, was instrumental in spreading against Semitic philosophy. They used daily writings, radio broadcasts, and open talks to spread myths about Jewish riches, control, and tricks, portraying Jews as both financially exploitative and ethically odd. This tireless, purposeful publicity campaign not only developed existing bias, but also affirmed the authenticity of the Nazis' anti-Semitic approaches. Once in control, Hitler's abuse of racism moved from exploratory to noteworthy with the entry of laws that efficiently disappointed Jews. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935, which legally identified who was considered a Jew and stripped them of their rights, were decreed by the Nazi administration as fundamental measures to ensure the purity and security of the German race. These laws completely established within the anti-Semitic ideas made by Hitler and his party visibly legalized the abuse and isolation of Jews from German society. The political exploitation of race discrimination served not as it were to substitute Jews, but too to mobilize and bind together the German people behind the Nazi administration. The open revival, which frequently included spiteful racism talk, was used to cultivate a sense of community and national character among Germans. By showing the mistreatment of Jews as a common cause, Hitler was able to develop mass support for the Nazi party, strengthening his grasp to control. The use of race prejudice as a political tool also served to create a climate of fear and terror, quieting resistance and solidifying control. The SA Sturmabteilung and afterward the SS Schutzstaffel were instrumental in this respect, using cruelty and fear against Jews and political rivals to further disagree and strengthen the story of Jewish guilt for Germany's burdens. Adolf's hatred for Jews was based on a manipulated mindset about them. He read from literature and speeches of prominent German leaders in his time. What are these writings about? How did they form his mindset? Hitler's horrifying mentality about Jews. Adolf Hitler's profound hatred for Jews requires more than a verifiable examination. It requires a journey into the mental network that constituted his intellect. This chapter investigates the mental measurements that might have fueled Hitler's enmity. Considering individual fights, double crossings, and a complex web of mental components, Hitler's early life was marked by fragility, dismissal, and a need for fatherly endorsement, which likely sowed the seeds of profound uncertainty. His disappointments, especially the dismissal by the Vienna Foundation of Fine Expressions, not as it were bruised his sense of self, but too opened up his existing feelings of insufficiency. Analysts propose that such significant frailty could have driven Hitler to look for control and approval through anything that implies, counting the attack and abuse of a complete gathering of individuals whom he may regard second-rate. Hitler's obsession with control and arrangement was evident in his political and military procedures and can be traced back to his mental roots. Growing up in a strict family, the early loss of his brother and the odd hardships of his early adulthood likely contributed to a desire for control over his environment. Jews with their particular social personality might have added a dagger to the consistency and arrangement Hitler craved, fueling his drive to kill what he seemed not to control. Psychological projection is a protection instrument where a person's state of mind, their unsatisfactory sentiment towards to others, might have played a part in Hitler's anti-Semitism. Unable to acknowledge his disappointment, he blamed his inability and disappointment on the Jews, blaming them for Germany's economic and social issues. This projection pardoned him to individual duty, but was, was too galvanized to open back against a common adversary. Hitler's composition and talks reveal a profound instability, specifically concerning Jews. He said Jewish individuals are not fair as a person, but as a portion of a worldwide scheme aimed at undermining and controlling the Aryan race. This suspicion was likely exacerbated by the chaotic post-World War environment, which was ready to scheme theories. Hitler's mentality to rationalize Germany's issues drove him to grasp and advance these unwarranted hypotheses. 
encouraging digging into his hostility to Semitic convictions. Hitler's extraordinary narcissism and conceit are well archived, with numerous history specialists and analysts noticing his affected side. He sees himself as a detailed figure predetermined to lead the German individuals to victory. Such a dysfunctional self-picture may have contributed to his contempt for Jews, whom he saw as an obstacle to his messianic mission. The refusal of the Jewish community to comply with his vision of society might have been seen as a coordinated challenge to his specialist in greatness. On a more profound mental level, Hitler's center on Jews as a source of all societal ills served a double reason. It's given a basic clarification of the complex issues confronting Germany, fulfilling his requirement for clear double arrangements. More critically, it advertised a substitute to rally the German individuals, channeling collective outrage and disappointment into a binding cause that occupied consideration from the genuine issues and disappointments of the Nazi administration. The part of the publicity of the Nazi regime's manipulation of mass media to spread its racist ideas is one of the foremost successful employments of purposeful publicity in modern history. Adolf Hitler and his administration used intentional publicity to spread and normalize race discrimination talks, implanting them profoundly inside the German societal texture. Central to the propaganda endeavors was the service of open illumination and purposeful publicity. Driven by Joseph Goebbels, this service coordinated all Nazi planned publicity endeavors, guaranteeing a reliable message that depicted Jews as the root cause of Germany's financial hardships and ethical rot. The adequacy of this planned publicity lay not fair in its ubiquity, but in its capacity to tap into existing partialities and intensify them. Turning inactive racism into a national action, the Nazi administration employed each accessible medium to spread its race prejudice belief system. Daily papers like Set Out Stormare frequently included caricatures of Jews in subhuman, bizarre shapes, thereby telling stories of Jewish schemes. Radios broadcasted Hitler's discourses and other cruel and racist substances specifically into homes making an unavoidable environment of hatred. Indeed, the film industry was filled with motion pictures, such as the period Jews depicting Jews as parasites, which helped in the race discrimination activities. The advertisement was not restricted to grown-up groups of onlookers. The Nazi administration focused on youthful minds through the instruction framework. Textbooks were modified to incorporate racist content, teaching children to see Jews as dangerous. School lessons and exercises emphasized racial virtue and Jewish inadequacy, normalizing these ideas from an early age. This teaching guaranteed the propagation of anti-Semitic philosophy over eras. The Nazis were capable of making open displays that fortified their anti-Semitic messages. Occasions just like the book burnings of 1933, where works by Jewish creators were freely burned, served as effective images of the regime's dismissal of Jewish impact. Additionally, the yearly recognition of the Reich slaughter, Nacht Kristallnacht, commemorated the so-called unrestricted open assaults on Jewish businesses and synagogues, forming a climate of antagonistic vibe towards Jews. The advertisement was inclusive of the domain of science, with the administration advancing unscientific predictions that demonstrated the racial mediocrity of Jews. Shows and instructive movies showcase these hypotheses, showing them as experimental proof of the threats posed by Jews to the Aryan race. This logical action gives an atmosphere of authenticity to the Nazis' racial approaches, making the people more open to hostility and racism philosophy. The Nazis advertised the religion of identity around Adolf Hitler himself. Depicted as the savior of the German individuals, Hitler was seen as the pioneer who could settle scores with the Jews. This faction of identity raised Hitler's status but tied the race discrimination plan smoothly to his vision for Germany, making resistance to one commensurate to restriction to the other. Though Adolf's hatred towards Jews was more pronounced than any other racist action, traces of racial discrimination can be seen throughout history. What does this teach? What history resonates with this? The waves of racism in history, Adolf Hitler's hostility to racism with extraordinary catastrophic results was not a variation within the archives of history. Instead, it speaks to an especially harmful appearance of racial preference, a dark thread woven through the texture of human history. This chapter investigates the echoes of Hitler's anti-Semitism and other written and modern occurrences of racial bias, drawing points that emphasize the determined challenge of combating scorn and separation.
A long time ago, Hitler's rise to control and racism had been a repetitive lash on civilizations all over the world. From medieval allegations of blood criticism in Europe to the Spanish Inquisition's mistreatment of Jews, racism has deep related roots. These prior occasions of Jewish abuse share common subjects with Nazi philosophy, counting envy, financial envy, and devout bias, outlining how deeply rooted racism was in European society around the 20th century. The prejudice that supported Hitler's worldview also found expression in the colonial projects of European powers. The oppression and misuse of non-European people groups were defended through convictions of racial prevalence and the civilizing mission of the colonizers. The similarities between colonial prejudice and Nazi racial speculations are blank, uncovering a shared belief system that degrades the other to disallow misuse and cruelty. The racial isolation and Jim Crow laws within the states that were united gives another strength to Nazi racial approaches. African Americans were efficiently disappointed and subjected to biased laws that echoed the perfection of Nuremberg's law on racism. The Ku Klux Klan's fear campaign against African Americans mirrors the hatred in the text against Jews, both driven by a craving to preserve racial virtue and prevalence. The apartheid in South Africa adds a ring to Hitler's racial beliefs. The lawful codification of racial isolation made a society where non-white South Africans were treated as less citizens, in the similitude of how Jews were been treated in Germany. The universal battle against apartheid and its inevitable destruction highlights the potential for worldwide racism activities. Shockingly, the echoes of Hitler's racial prejudice are not limited to history. Modern occurrences of racial bias from the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar to the Treaty of Uyghur Muslims in China remind us that the idea of racial dominion in the tool of being a victim makes powerful power stay. The rise of patriot growth over the globe, usually followed by prejudice and racist talk, marks the presumed invaluableness of the lessons from the Nazi time. The part of the publicity in spreading racism and nationalist ideas has changed with innovation. The stage the social media is in now has gotten to be the modern correspondence of 1930s radio programs, empowering the quick spread of hatred talks and scheme speculations. This advanced instrument challenges us to discover other ways to curb the spread of racial bias and ensure that history's darkest chapters are not repeated. What are your thoughts on the actions of Adolf Hitler? What do you think of Jews? Leave your thoughts in the comments section and also like, share, and subscribe for more related content.